on the News Channel 5 Network. This is Open Line. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Open Line. Fascinating discussion tonight. We're talking about mass shootings and the debate that often follows one of these horrible events. Two Vanderbilt University professors who have been all over national media are with us today. They've written an article in the American Journal of Public Health, and they, they basically have done a study saying, and they're challenging the assumption about gun violence and mental illness that often comes up after these mass shootings. So I'm happy to have with us uh, Dr. Jonathan Metzl, uh, Vanderbilt University professor. Thank you for being with us. Thanks so much. Great to be here. And also Dr. Ken McLeish, uh, Vanderbilt University professor. Thank you for being with us. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure. All right. So you've written this article. It's been picked up, um, getting a lot of a, a lot of attention. The essence of it is what? Well. I'll start and then maybe Ken can jump in. Sure. Um, I'm trained as a psychiatrist and first let me say I understand why people turn to questions of mental illness after mass shootings for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that um, who but a crazy person would go kill innocent kids, high schoolers, uh, people in a movie theater or something like that. And so there are issues about the psychiatric histories of mass shooters that are important to keep in mind. And the other is, as I think people, even President Trump does, to draw a line between civilized society, us, and somebody else who's outside the bounds of civilized society, somebody who's crazy or something like that. And so in that sense, I understand why we have this conversation. Um, the problem we get into a lot of times is that um, politicians like President Trump, organizations like the NRA, and just everyday citizens who mean well, um, they say, well, if we just limit guns to people with mental illness, that would solve the problem of mass shooting. And so what we do in our research is we try to say, unfortunately, it's not that simple. And it's not that simple for a couple of reasons, and I'll maybe lay out the main ones and then maybe Ken, Ken can jump in. Um, I think one main one is that the population of people with mental illness are not, ironically, the highest risk people uh, for, uh, for committing gun violence. And so if you look at, for example, the main psychiatric diagnoses like depression, schizophrenia, other diagnoses like that, there's no symptom in those, in those illnesses that says that person is more likely to go harm somebody else. And so the people who psychiatrists are seeing already are not the highest risk people. Uh, a lot of times people with, that have mass shootings, they commit mass shootings, are not severely psychotic people. They're not going to be institutionalized. They're people that have what are called character disorders, uh, things like that, lifelong, lifelong factors. So number one is that people with mental illness are less likely, ironically, than the national average to shoot other people. There's no mental illness that, that causes that. Um, point number two is that because of that, there's no, there's no diagnostic test that a mental health practitioner can do to say, Gosh, I can pick out of the thousands of people I see, I can pick somebody out of a lineup and say that person is, uh, is going to go on to, to commit that act. And then if you look at the data across the swath of the United States, it turns out that people with mental illness are actually more likely, <laughs> they're more likely to be victims of gun violence than perpetrators of gun violence. So do you think this puts an undue burden on, I guess, healthcare professionals to kind of single out, okay, this person is going to be the next one to do one of these mass shootings. Well, I think, and Ken will probably agree with me here, when, when you just look at mental illness, you're not looking at all these other factors, including gun policy, gun laws, addiction, social networks, all these other factor, factors that are far more likely to be correlated with gun violence and mass shootings. Yeah, yeah, and you really hit the nail on the head. It does that exact thing, that, that this widespread cultural narrative that we have that says that uh, mental illness is a satisfying and appropriate explanation for why it is that people commit acts of violence uh, really does uh, place a tremendously unfair burden on psychiatry and mental health service providers um, and it also is tremendously stigmatizing to uh, to the mentally ill as a population and that's a population that it's worth mentioning that at some at, at one point or another in our lives is going to include over half of all Americans right uh, that that's the the statistic that I'm most familiar with somewhere in the range of 55 to 60 percent um, of, of all Americans at some point in their lives will uh, will either show symptoms that would suggest that they could be assessed for a mental disorder that is in the diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders um, or actually receive a diagnosis or undergo treatment for a diagnosis all the way down to the most basic elements of you know, mild forms of anxiety and depression that, that, uh, that so many of us are familiar with, right? Um, 
and yet those are the, those are the same diagnoses that people frequently reach for in the wake of mass shootings to say, oh, this person was seen by a psychiatrist, they were talking to a psychologist, they were taking medication, when in fact those are uh, those are those are features that vast swaths, exactly as Jonathan was saying, that vast swaths of the population uh, share those characteristics. But as Jonathan said, how. This has become a talking point, and it's one that seems to be, I've seen it embraced by both sides. That's why I think it's so interesting to have you all here and, and pushing back a little bit on this. I guess, first of all, and as you, you, you brought up right off the top, somebody who does this, how can they be defined as anything other than that? Well, you know what I mean? Oh, how, how do we, how do we not yeah. define them as that? Right, right, right. Well, I mean, certainly there's something about the nature of mass shootings, right? Particularly the kind of spectacular form of American mass shootings. They're traumatizing. They're news stories. There's a whole cycle around that. And certainly the mental illness story becomes part of that cycle for good reason, right? But I think, let's just take the Parkland shooting uh, as one example. The Parkland shooting had a shooter whose name I don't like to mention, um, but, uh, but a shooter who had had a psychiatric history for the course of much of his uh, young adult life, but also had a bunch of other factors going on in his life. Uh, history of conduct problems in school, very turbulent family situation, very, very easy state to get access to a semi-automatic weapon without any kind of oversight uh, in that regard. Um, warning signs that were missed. So when we just say, oh my gosh, this is just a mental illness problem, I think the problem that we're trying to address in, in our work is to say, you're closing the door on all these other factors that have to do with, with social networks and, and also with gun policies, right? And so in a way, the, the issue we're trying to push back on is not to say that this person is normal. They're not. They're not. They are outliers for sure. And they're outliers of responsible gun owners. Most responsible gun owners are, are law-abiding law -abiding citizens. We have no problem with that whatsoever. The, the problem is there's a reason why this mental illness narrative is pushed on both sides, but particularly by the NRA and people in the Trump administration right now to say right away, even before they know anything about the case, to say it's a mental illness problem. And the reason that we're pushing back on that is to say when you just say it's mental illness, you close the door on looking at all these other issues linked to gun, gun policy, which is really where we should be having the conversation. And so you think it's pushed to avoid the discussion about gun policy. I certainly do, yeah. And whether it's done deliberately or not, it undoubtedly, indisputably has the effect of, uh, of directing attention away from other kinds of gun policy uh, discussions. And one of the things, I'm sure we'll get into this down the line, but one of the things about, uh, that, that we've learned about the range of potential interventions that are out there and ways of, of thinking about and framing this problem and trying to address it is that, especially in the United States, in the, uh, the, the relatively gun-saturated uh, world that we live in in this country, and I say that in a descriptive sense, right? We, we have, America has far higher per capita gun ownership um, by an order of magnitude than any other country. Both sides uh, would agree the, to that. In the world, yes. Um, and, uh, uh, but that one of the, um, the, uh, uh, the things that, uh, uh, that then happens is we also get locked into these debates that say, oh, it must be this one single explanation or this other single explanation. And in fact, because guns are so widespread in our society and touch so many elements of our social world, we have to be ready to talk about a range of different avenues uh, by, uh, by which gun crime and gun violence happen and a range of different inter interventions that are gonna be necessary for protecting people from gun violence. Um, and again, I think that's one of the reasons that, that we work so hard to kind of push back against the idea of mental illness as a, as a single and comprehensive explanation for how and why it is that these things happen. I mean, we if, often oh. have a gun, we have people on both sides mm -hmm. of this issue on this show, and I'm, I'm always fascinated by the debate. Those that are um, pro-gun, you know, concerned about more restrictions on gun rights, do quickly go to the fact that this is a mental illness problem. What you have there is a very powerful lobby. There's no doubt about it. They've been able to to cut off a lot of the um, uh, push here to have more um, restrictions put on guns. So a very powerful lobby. But is it is it bad to have a powerful lobby saying we need more mental health um, help, you know, more help for the mentally ill? I mean, do you think they, they could use that power to actually help get some, some things for um, helping the mentally ill? Or mm -hmm. again, do you think it's just they're trying to divert our attention. Well, I'm a psychiatrist. Um, I certainly think we need more resources um, to help 
the problem of the diagnosis and treatment of mental illness in this country. Uh, and I think probably every psychiatrist would say that, no matter what side. I mean, psychiatrists, just like society, are very divided on this issue. Um, but I think that's a different issue from what happens after, after mass shootings, which is the argument that if a psychiatrist could have just seen what, what the warning signs were, we could have prevented this. That's where we want to jump in and say, actually, that's not right. And so um, I can just tell you from the statistical work that I've done and that Ken and, Ken and I have done together, um, w first of all, we wish there was an easy answer to this problem. Um, nobody on any side of this debate wants the kind of trauma and death that we're seeing in this country right now. Certainly nobody on other, any side, uh, and, and I have a feeling that without the intervention of lobbyists, we could probably come together on some common ground solutions. Unfortunately, I think the issue is if you limited guns to severely mentally ill people in this country, um, even if that's possible, I don't think it would make a dent in terms of gun crime and certainly not in mass shootings. So I think those are two separate issues. You all identified um, things that you think, factors I guess, that do predict gun violence more broadly than mentally ill, right? What, what are some of those factors? Well, one of the things that we know is simply the, the, the bald, straightforward fact that at the population level, uh, uh, there's a lot of reliable data that tells us that the presence of more guns and the presence of less restrictive gun laws tends to result in higher rates of gun fatality. Uh, and also that those, uh, that as we know from, uh, from colleagues working on this issue at a number of other institutions, that those uh, rates of gun deaths also tend to increase over time as well in places where guns are more loosely regulated. Uh, and so, so simply the availability of guns, uh, and again, this, I, th I think it's really important to be clear here uh, that we're, you know, folks are used to thinking about this as a, a question of individual responsibility. And to talk about the danger that guns pose to public health at the population level is not the same as making an accusation of individual gun owners or gun owners as a group uh, that they're somehow an irresponsible population. But what it is possible for epidemiologists and public health scholars uh, to know and to measure at the population level is this simple fact that the, uh, the prevalence of guns and increased legalized access to guns is strongly and directly associated with higher rates of gun death. And if I could add to that, uh, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, just there are other factors. When we think about some of the laws that we have here in Tennessee, um, I think uh, people who study this also point to um, the presence of guns and also um, lots of alcohol or drugs. So if there are substances at the moment of, of, of altercation, it raises the chance that there's going to be a shooting at, if there's a, some kind of argument by anywhere from five to seven fold. And we might think about that when we think about do we really want to have people carry loaded guns into bars like we do here. Um, a past history of violence is very predictive of future gun violence. And so we might want to think about that when we think about do we want people who have a history of, for example, domestic abuse uh, to, to have that. Uh, to have access and or should they be flagged um, and so I think that um, there are kind of common everyday factors and that's why we push for things like what are called gun violence restraining orders because there are high risk high risk people that we can identify that are not mentally ill. This kind of sets the table for the discussion. Please. We're going to start taking calls. Uh, if you're on the line, hold on. If you want to call in, there's the number, 615-737-PLUS, 615-737-7587. We're also streaming this on our Facebook page, on the News Channel 5 Facebook page. Uh, put um, an appropriate comment down and, and perhaps we'll read it here on the air. So we'll take a break, be back right after this.